So let's continue with our discussion of descriptive egoism and the wants argument for descriptive egoism. So we, the wants argument says you always do what you most want to do, and you always most want to do what is most in your self-interest, and from that it follows that you always act selfishly doing what is most in your self-interest. And we know that this argument is valid, and the question is whether or not are both of the premises true. And in the previous video, we saw, well, if a want is something like thirst or hunger or greed or lust or something like that, then uh, we have lots of motivations besides those. And so you always, it's not the case that you always do what you most want to do. Sometimes those other motivations went out, and so premise one is false, if that's what we mean by a want. And then the argument is unsound. It's valid, but it's unsound because it has a false premise, and we can't, and it's not a good argument for the conclusion. It doesn't have a good foundation. But the descriptive egoist is going to say, um, well, maybe we can interpret want more broadly and in a way that will make premise one come out true and will also make premise two come out true. And then the descriptive egoist says, I will have my argument. You're right if want has this narrow sense, but maybe we can have a bigger sense of want where want includes more motivations and then both the premises will come out to be true. And there's a simple sense in which we can sort of get at this. We think, if I did it, I wanted to do it. When we say, I want to do something, or some, when you say someone wants to do something, what you mean is just they're motivated to do it. So if I say, I want X, or if someone wants X, what does that mean? It just means they are motivated to get X. Or if, they're motive, if they want to do something, it just means they're motivated to do it. It's not describing any specific kind of motivation. It's not saying, oh, the kind of motivation like lust and thirst and hunger. It's just saying there's a motivation to do it. So in, in this sense, a feeling of duty, of respect, of obligation, of empathy, of benevolence, of caring for another, of love, any of those would be wants because they motivate you to do things. You love somebody, you're motivated to help them, you're motivated not to hurt them. And so in that sense, you don't want to hurt them, and you do want to help them. Just because when what is it all we mean when we say that you want to do that is you're motivated to do that. And so in this sense of want, all of these sorts of moral motivations that we've been thinking about, they are wants. So do you always do what you want to do in this sense? Yeah, I mean, because it just, this first premise just says you always do what you're most motivated to do or you, what you're motivated to do. And that seems like that's probably true, right? How do we act? Well, we have motivations in any given situation and we play them out. Sometimes we're in situations that we don't like a lot, that we really don't like. Maybe we're even being coerced. But even in those situations, we're still motivated. If someone is threatening us, it's because they're threatening something that we care about and we're motivated to... Uh, to preserve that thing that they're threatening. And so even if there's this sort of the, the threat is coming from outside, nonetheless, we're, it's threatening to us because of what we care about and we're motivated to preserve ourselves or our loved ones or our property or whatever it might be. So premise one at least seems true on this sense of want. So what about premise two? You always most want to do what you believe is most in your self-interest. What does that mean? Well. What it means if we think about want in terms of motivation, it says you are always most motivated to do what you believe is most in your self-interest. So that's the question then. Are you always most motivated to do what you believe is most in your self-interest? Well, we can distinguish between two facts about a motivation, a motivational state. So maybe um, my respect or my, my love for uh, some people in my family. So the person motivated, that's me. The object of the motivation, that's my family. And all of my motivations are mine because I'm the one who's motivated. So it's me who is has my hunger, it's me who has my thirst, it's me who has my love, it's me who has my respect, and so on. But some of those motivations are directed towards other people. Um, what premise two says is that all the objects of my motivation are directed towards me. So not only is it I that have all the motivations, it, my motivations, they're mine, but also what are they about? They're about my self-interest. The things that the objects, the motivation is towards, the only thing is me and how I'm doing. Was well, that true? I mean, that doesn't seem so obvious. And certainly in that passage from Meng Zi that we saw, um, he talks about, well, let's look at it again. So he talks about commiseration. And 
So commiseration is sympathy with others. It's feeling care for others' suffering. Uh, reverence and respect, that's respect. It, there can be self-respect, of course, but there's also respect for others, respect for others' dignity, their autonomy, their uh, capacity to feel pain and happiness. All of those are uh, at least look like they're other-oriented. And so um, Meng Zi looks like he's giving us a lot of examples of motivational states that while they're had by an individual, are directed towards other people and directed towards their welfare. So if, for example, you keep your promise to somebody, why might you do that? Well, there are lots of reasons, but one is you feel obligated to keep your, prom your promise out of respect for them. So who has the obligation? You have the motivation. You are the one that has the respect and the feeling and the consequent feeling of obligation. But it's towards them. The object of the motivation is the respect, the safety, the trust of the other person. And so the object is not, at least apparently, your self-interest. This certainly seems possible. It certainly seems like it's what happens when we're motivated in these ways. You might keep your promise for, to somebody for all sorts of other reasons, but this certainly seems like a possible reason. And if it were, well, that would be a reason that isn't... Uh, a self-interested reason. It's you that have the motivation. It's your desire, but it's a desire uh, for somebody else's welfare and dignity, that that welfare and dignity uh, be preserved. So if wants involve all of our motivations, then if we think about, well, what are moral motivations like? Whether well, respect for people, care for people, love for people, sympathy, benevolence, and, and all of those motivations, and if, if those are included in wants, if wants involve all motivations and therefore involve all moral motivations, then if we ask, do you always most want to do what is most in your self-interest, it sure looks like the answer is no. It looks like you have all these motivations that are other-directed. They're yours, they're your wants in this broad sense of want, they're your motivations, but they're towards other people or maybe other animals, your, your uh, care for your pet or your desire to, you, maybe you're vegetarian and you so don't eat animals out of concern for the, and one reason why you might do that is out of concern for their welfare. So again, if want is used in this broad sense, then it again turns out to not be sound. It's still valid, but on this sense, in, on this way of reading it, it has its second premise is false. And so if these, if the criticisms of these two premises are correct that I've offered in these two videos, then here's the situation. We can think, okay, well, if we interpret wants in this more sort of limited sense, they're these body sensation based, they don't go through our higher uh, abilities to think and so on, then premise one comes out false because we act on non-body sort of these simpler motivations. Do you always most want to do what you believe is in your self-interest in this sense of body or sensation based? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but it doesn't matter because the first premise is false. On the other hand, if we think that, okay, wants are all of our motivations, then the first premise does come out true. You always do what you must want to do, at least probably does. But the second premise comes out false because you have motivations, it's so, so it seems, oriented towards other people's welfare and dignity. And so however we interpret the word want, whether we mean it this way or this way, one of the premises comes out false. And so there's no obvious interpretation of the word want that makes both of them come out true. Now maybe there's some other uh, in way to interpret want that can make them come out true, but the fact that we can have other or oriented motivations, that we can care about other people, um, or at least apparently care, if that's true, if it if it, things are how they seem and really we really can care about other people and be motivated to act out of that care and concern and respect, then descriptive egoism is false. So this feeling of moral obligation is, it's a motivation, it's not body or sense-based, and it's about somebody besides the person that has it, it's about somebody else. And uh, let's see, let's get back there. The existence of these kinds of feelings is uh, pose a really big problem for descriptive egoism. As long as there are such feelings, if there really are, then descriptive egoism is false. And so what the descriptive egoist wants to say is, aha, you are wrong about the, the interpretation that I've been giving of these moral motivations, that I'm the one who has them, but they're oriented towards others, that this is the view that Meng Zi has, it's the view that although that Plato has, although not in the reading that we had. Well, the descriptive egoist has to say what look like other regarding motivations actually aren't, 
Actually, all of your most fundamental motivations concern your own welfare. And any other motivations there are derived from self-interest. And so what look like uh, care, concern, respect for others is actually derived from a more fundamental self-interested motivation. Well, why would that be? Well, that's what we're going to look at in our last video of our last videos of this module, and then also a little bit in some videos in the next module. So we're going to see the descriptive egoist is going to say, okay, it looks like there are these moral motivations that one person has that are oriented towards another, but actually there aren't. That's a mistaken appearance. All of your most fundamental motivations are for yourself, and anything else that looks like it's oriented uh, towards other people is actually maybe in some covert and hidden way actually really self-interested. So let's see what that's like.